Hello and welcome to a new series of Solomon's Cave. From my previous videos, you may have picked up that I am a Bible scholar with an interest in philosophy. However, I have also had an interest in science and the creation-evolution debate which occasionally pops up in the background of biblical studies and philosophy. After thinking about the format for a while, I have finally decided to put the first video online. The videos about creation and evolution will be longer and will not be in the usual curricular or serial format with one video explicitly building on the previous ones. Instead, these will be more independent or standalone videos. Tone-wise, I want these videos to be far more informative than debate and debunk. I want to invite everyone, regardless of your convictions, to enjoy these videos and learn something interesting related to this debate. So instead of Darwin was actually a racist in less than one minute, you may get a one hour video about Darwin's book The Voyages of the Beagle. And instead of three proofs for human evolution no creationist can deny, I may do a long form video with an introductory overview of all Neanderthal fossils that have been found and the history of their interpretation. This way, I want to inform people on both sides of the debate about some basic facts that should not be in dispute, so that any debate people will have can start from a broader base of shared knowledge. As for representing the opinions of both sides, I want to make sure that I am as charitable as possible to all, steelmanning each position, not just to defend it, but to make you really think about the arguments presented. It is my experience that trying to understand your opponent's position, be it in the creation evolution debate, theology, or chess, will also help you understand your own position better. If you would like a preview of how I might do that, I can point you to my series on the pre-Socratic philosophers. Their scientific theories were not just wrong, but with our modern understanding of science and reality, often laughably wrong. Yet, in trying to understand how they came to their opinions, we can sometimes discern some clever observations and sharp reasoning. Reasoning which can help us to think about the nature of reality and appreciate the importance of the answers which modern science has come up with. In this video, I will begin by explaining my definitions of evolution and creationism and explain, in an introductory way, why it is often difficult to have a real conversation about this topic. Evolution. A good place to start is to discuss several definitions of the term evolution you will find in both scientific literature and in public discourse. First, there is the distinctly scientific biological term of evolution. This is the only one for which you can relatively easily find a proper definition when you open up a scientific textbook. The online Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, a highly recommended free resource I've often consulted for my series on the pre-Socratics, quotes two science textbooks that illustrate this definition. Biological evolution is change in the properties of groups of organisms over the course of generations. It embraces everything from slight changes in the proportions of different forms of a gene within a population, to the alterations that led from the earliest organisms to dinosaurs, bees, oaks, and humans. This one is from the book by Futuyma. And if you pay close attention, you see that it describes a spectrum of changes in groups of organisms. I guess his editor didn't want him to use the word creatures here. But it is all about changes. On the one extreme of the spectrum, there's a change in proportions of different forms of a gene within a population. To give an example, let's say that there is a hair color gene, and one form of the gene leads to a person having red hair, and another form of the same gene leads to a person having blonde hair. In reality, it is more complicated, but let's keep the example simple. If then, after a few generations, the percentage of people with the red hair variant of the gene has decreased by 0.1%, that is an example of evolution. On the other extreme, he talks about not the mechanisms that cause evolution, but about the result of evolution. Namely, the currently existing biodiversity having evolved from the earliest organism, all but explicitly stating common descent. That is, all living organisms are descended ultimately, 
from the very first biological or living thing. So biological evolution is both a process of change and the result of that process. A slightly different definition is given in an older textbook. Evolution may be defined by any net directional change or any cumulative change in the characteristics of organisms or populations over many generations. In other words, descent with modification. It explicitly includes the origin as well as the spread of alleles, variants, trait values or character states. Here too, change is key and it can only be observed over various generations and within larger populations, not individuals. These two definitions pair well with the first definition given by the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary. A. Descent with modification from pre-existing species. Cumulative inherited change in a population of organisms through time leading to the appearance of new forms. The process by which new species or populations of living things develop from pre-existing forms through successive generations. Added here is the notion that evolution leads to new forms or new species, which makes explicit what the above-mentioned definitions implied. It would, however, exclude the possibility of evolving to a previous form, and it seems that this definition would also exclude the minimal example given by Futuyma, namely of variation in distribution. Merriam-Webster goes on. Also, the scientific theory explaining the appearance of new species and varieties through the action of various biological mechanisms such as natural selection, genetic mutation or drift, and hybridization. b. The historical development of a biological group, such as a species. Here evolution becomes meta or takes a step back and doesn't describe what evolution is, but describes what people mean when they talk about evolution in the abstract sense. The abstract sense goes further with the next definition, which is also very common. To A, a process of change in a certain direction, or C, a process of continuous change from a lower, simpler, or worse, to a higher, more complex, or better state. Here I'm only focusing on the two uses under the second definition, namely a general process of change, which can be applied to anything, not just biology. You can talk about political parties evolving, or a philosophy evolving, or an economic system evolving. Anything can change and evolve. Which leads to usage to C, namely a moral evolution, where things go from low simple and bad to high, complex and good. To look a bit beyond the horizon, this last sense, though definitely in the minds of many older biologists in the 19th century, is currently heavily warned against by modern biologists. For modern biologists, more evolved does not in any way mean better or higher or even more complex. There are several reasons for this, but one is that biologists try to keep their emotions or their value judgments out of their research, for as soon as you start thinking about one species of fruit flies as better than another species of fruit flies, it can influence subconsciously how you think about them, how you treat them, and how you describe them, contaminating your research and your conclusions. Not to mention that there was this whole thing in the 19th and 20th centuries, where one group of humans thought that they were better or more evolved than another group of humans. But whenever you are outside of biology and in everyday speech, this meaning of evolving, becoming better, is still very much in use. Especially when used to describe changes in non-biological things. See 2a. Then there is one more definition of evolution that is interesting here, and that is the fifth definition of Merriam-Webster. 5. A process in which the whole universe is a progression of interrelated phenomena. This is interesting, for Merriam-Webster started with biology, then abstracted it, then applied it to other phenomena, and now applies it to everything all at once. The whole universe, as is, is evolving. And this leads to my own definitions of evolution, that is, the definitions I will be using throughout this series. My first definition is the biological theory of evolution. 
Whenever I talk about this, I am exclusively talking about biology, and I will be using a definition very close to the one from Fatuima, namely a theory describing change in or of a group of organisms through generations. The second definition I will call the scientific theory or theories of evolution, with a capital T and a capital E. With this I mean not just biological evolution, but also abiogenesis, the process by which life came from non-living matter, the evolution of the Earth, the solar system, the universe and the space-time continuum all wrapped together. Finally, I recognize that there is a tendency among modern, secular people to not just believe that the scientific theory of evolution describes the past accurately, but also that it tells us something about topics like value, the meaning of life, and the existence, or rather non-existence, of God or gods. This is what I will call evolutionism or evolutionistic thinking. Creation Creationism is a term which, if used in its most generous way, can apply to almost any belief system in which a supernatural being influenced the course of history in any way. However, here I will have to defer to a more common and practical use of the term, given that it is a term which is used in opposition to evolution, or the theory of evolution, or evolutionism, it will have to describe a modern phenomenon. Surely, pre-modern or pre-19th century Christians, as well as Jews, Muslims, and people of various other creeds, believed that God created the heavens and the earth, and can hence be called creationists. But Though their view of the origin of the universe is informative for this debate, it is the debate itself which, in many ways, created creationism as it exists today. So, whenever I use the term creationism in these videos, I will refer to a largely Christian, theological, philosophical and scientifically informed movement. It is a theological movement, for it deals with theological questions about God as creator, the interpretation of the Bible, systematic theological questions, and historical theological questions. It is also a philosophical movement, dealing with the philosophy of science, epistemology, and other topics. And it is scientifically informed, with which I mean that it responds to existing and often established scientific theories, and that it applies scientific findings, terminology, and methods to describe itself. At the moment I will avoid calling it scientific, as that will open up a whole can of worms about the definition of science and whether or not creationistic science qualifies. In this series I may very well decide to explore non-Christian creationists and their approaches, or pre-Darwinian Christianity and what it had to say about the creation of the world, but the focus will be on contemporary Christian creationists. The group that seems to be the most comprehensive in their challenging of the scientific theory of evolution is probably young earth creationism and it is likely the group you were already thinking of when you saw the topic of this video. Young earth creationists will certainly be discussed in this series, but there are various other ones as well, including but not limited to old earth creationists who reject certain aspects of the biological theory of evolution but not the notion that the earth is a few billion years old. There are also others, like theistic evolutionists and proponents of intelligent design. The last group often deliberately phrases their theories in such a way that people of all creeds are invited to agree, and they even make an appeal to agnostic people. What all these groups tend to have in common though, is their agreement with the statement that the existing diversity of life we encounter on this planet either cannot be or is not the result of exclusively naturalistic processes. In other words, all the natural processes we know about put together are insufficient to explain why we have trees, birds, fish and humans. So far I have set out what some of the problems are, the term evolution being subtly slippery, often without participants and observers of the debate being aware of which definition is being used. Likewise, not everyone who challenges the biological theory of evolution, or the scientific theory of evolution, or evolutionism, is the same. 
There are many different types of creationists out there. Several of them, it should be noted, probably aren't comfortable with that label. But all those are external challenges which could be cleared up by a few introductory remarks. But there are several other challenges as well, including the problem of scope, the problem of depth, the problem of just enough Greek to be dangerous, and the problem of the personal and the political. The problem of scope. Let's start with just the biological theory of evolution. Here we are dealing with virtually the entire discipline of biology, including biochemistry, molecular biology, genetics, cell biology, anatomy, ecology and pathology, just to name a few. The biological theory of evolution also plays itself out in each of these subdisciplines, each of which may take a lifetime to master. Not to mention that every group of organisms, be it bacteria, fungi, plants, fish, birds, mammals or humans, has their evolutionary history mapped out and discussed in detail in the literature. And then there are related supporting sciences, including some obvious ones like paleontology, geology, chemistry, physics and mathematics, just to name a few. If we start tackling the scientific theory of evolution, then we not only have to delve a lot deeper into the already mentioned supporting sciences, but also add in astronomy and astrophysics, fields of study that were already tangentially related to some of the supporting disciplines, but also enormously important for the discussion of the origin of the universe and the Earth. To list just a few more relevant subdisciplines, under geology we find geomorphology, stratigraphy, sedimentology, geochronology, historical geology, mineralogy, crystallography, petrology, hydrology, geophysics, and volcanology. Paleontology includes molecular and micropaleontology, as well as paleobiology and biostratigraphy. For chemistry, we have organic chemistry and biochemistry, nuclear chemistry, and geochemistry, which are most directly relevant, but other chemical processes are also important to know about. Physics is important when dealing with mechanics, fluid mechanics, atomic physics, nuclear physics, general relativity, optics, and thermodynamics. Within astronomy, astrophysics, planetary science, astrogeology, spectroscopy, galactic astronomy, cosmology, and meteorology are most obviously relevant. And for mathematics, we need not just the basics, but also things like calculus, which deals with rate of change, logic, probability theory, and statistics at a minimum. And honestly, these are only the ones I can come up with off the top of my head. And each of these disciplines and subdisciplines is woven together with all the other ones like a tightly knit tapestry. Start pulling on one thread and you will soon find that you cannot pull very far because all the other subdisciplines keep it in place. This means that if you want to change something big about the scientific consensus, you have to be an undisputed expert in your field, but you must also find a way to deal with all the other fields of science you are not an expert in. And this is also why I am not particularly interested in giving a few proofs for or against evolution, because in my understanding, the theory is simply too large to be done justice, defending or attacking, by a few arguments or pieces of evidence here or there. In fact, in this series I don't really want to attack or defend evolution, but I want to use the existence of disagreement in the public square to be used as a vehicle to introduce you to all these relevant fields of science and other inquiries. Additionally, if you want to cover both sides of the debate and look beyond science, one should also look at theology, philosophy and history and various subdisciplines there as well, including biblical studies, systematic theology, ontology, epistemology, philosophy of science, history of science, 19th and 20th century history of thought, and one can also look at how evolutionary theories are being used in psychology, sociology, anthropology, and prehistorical research as well. Ideally, to properly understand the whole creation-evolution debate, or even just the biological theory of evolution in isolation, one should be an expert in each of these relevant subdisciplines, and also have a more than passing familiarity with the supporting fields of research. However, 
here we run into the next problem. The problem of depth. Here is something experts can agree on. Every introductory textbook on the topics they are an expert in is wrong. Or maybe not exactly wrong, but it is often outdated by at least 20 years. And it is simplified to the point of near uselessness. Let me give you an analogy of what I mean. Let's say you are studying a second language. One of the things you will find in any introduction or learning book is vocabulary lists. Long lists made up of two columns. In the left column, you will find words in your target language. And in the right column, you will find words from your native language. Simple enough, right? Then you pick up a dictionary of your own language. And you find that the word you just studied has four different meanings. Well, you kind of knew that. But the dictionary helps you clarify this. When you ask your teacher, they will say that two of those four meanings can be translated with the word in the vocab list. The other two meanings require two more words. Sometime later, you are now proficient enough in your target language that you pick up a dictionary of that language. You find out that the word you originally learned also has four meanings. Two can translate back to the word you originally learned, but the other two mean two completely different things. And then you find out that the word in your original language doesn't just have four meanings. It can be translated correctly, depending on the nuance and the context, by two or three more words, even if the same definition is used. And then you remember a number of expressions, sayings and proverbs in your native language that use that original word, but most of them either don't have a good translation in the target language, or you have to use very different words altogether. And then you learn a bunch of expressions, sayings and proverbs in your target language that use the word you originally learned, and again you cannot back translate those using the word from your vocab list. And then you learn about regional dialects. And then you learn about how the meaning of the word shifted over time. And then you learn how the youth uses that word. And then you learn how that word is used in political discussions. And how it is used in business meetings. And how it is used in academic contexts. And in religious contexts. And then you learn that this word is famous or infamous because it was used in a popular song. Or in a slogan. Or how it was used by an important historical figure in that country. So you cannot use that word in certain contexts. Or if you do, the meaning changes and you unintentionally add a nuance. So, going back to creation and evolution and all the various subdisciplines. It is very difficult for an expert in one subdiscipline, say genetics, to also be an expert in biochemistry, molecular biology, cell biology and zoology. And those are closely related fields. How is any one person ever going to learn more than just the introductory material from all fields that are relevant to the whole scientific theory of evolution, or even just the biological theory of evolution? It is unavoidable that in learning about creation and evolution, even an extremely dedicated and learned individual can only learn the equivalent of vocab lists of most subdisciplines in one lifetime. It is impossible to be an expert in everything, which means that you have to rely on an extremely dumbed down and rudimentary understanding of most of the relevant information that is out there. Just enough Greek to be dangerous. One of the reasons I set out these two previous problems is how our minds can play tricks on us. Often, after we've studied a particular topic for a brief period of time, we think that we know a lot. We think that after a few vocabulary lists and some grammar rules, we know enough about the language to comment on it. This is what my first Greek teacher called just enough Greek to be dangerous. Meaning that despite everything I've just said about scope and depth, we often feel like we know a lot after a brief introduction. And we think that we just learned some good arguments after having listened to a particularly gifted science educator or a well-versed apologist or even after having read a few books on a topic. It is only when we begin the long and arduous journey of becoming an expert that we begin to see how little we knew when we first started. And now we feel, despite having learned so much more, that we become more and more cautious about giving firm answers. Or to oversimplify this phenomenon, 
We are prone to feeling more confident and more certain about something if we know a little, but we slowly grow less certain as we learn more. The reason I bring this up here is because of what I just talked about, namely that we cannot be experts in every field and that having had an introduction alone is often less than useless in truly understanding a subdiscipline. And this goes for me too. I may be an expert in some things, but I only barely graduated from some closely related subdisciplines. What gives me the ability or the right to talk about any of the other disciplines? I am an Old Testament specialist, and I know how little I know about closely related subjects, like the New Testament, Second Temple Judaism, Assyriology, Egyptology, and the like. There are even areas within my specialty where I know I could or should know more, like I should be more fluent in Biblical Hebrew, or I should know more about the latest research on Deuteronomy, or I should know more about the different manuscripts of the Book of Samuel, or the latest archaeological findings from Iron Age 2. How can I ever talk about anything more profound than the equivalent of vocab lists when talking about genetics or hydrology or redshifts in distant galaxies? I am not, and will likely never be, even remotely an expert in any, let alone all of these topics. And the same goes for you. Delving into any of these topics, either in this YouTube channel or anywhere else, will only give you just a little bit of knowledge. Don't let it go to your head. You will be tempted to think you know a lot, or at least enough about a particular subject, but all you did was learn a little vocab list. There is always more, much more to be learned, and thinking you know enough can be a very dangerous thing. And this goes for people on all sides of the debate. In fact, one of the reasons debates often get heated very quickly is precisely because people overestimate their grasp of the subject at hand and get annoyed when they are called out on their lack of knowledge, either by an actual expert or by someone who is equally punching above their weight. Now, does that mean we should not learn new things? Should we not study vocab lists? Should we only become experts in one field and never look beyond it? Well, that's ultimately up to you, but here's my take. It is true that only learning to the level of an introduction isn't much, but it can be fun nonetheless. Learning, when not done for school or for a job, should be fun, and learning something new, even if it's only superficial, can be greatly enjoyable. Additionally, though introductions are shallow, they are also necessary. You have to start simple. Imagine someone didn't speak English at all, and instead of giving them vocab lists and simple exercises and basic grammar, you give them the collected works of Shakespeare without translation and tell them to read it because, well, that's what we study in an advanced English course. Most of us cannot start at an advanced level. Maybe if we are an expert in one area and we want to learn about closely related fields, we can skip some of the introductions. But most of us need to start from zero, as long as we remember that these introductions are just that. Introductions. The personal and the political. What a tendency for people, or at least some people, to overestimate the level of expertise can lead to needlessly heated debates and an unwillingness to listen to each other. The personal and the political make everything worse. To make this clear, let me describe two fictional people who may be interested in this debate. No, who will have a vested interest in this debate. Perhaps there is a young woman who grew up in a strict Christian household. She may not hate her family, but the church? Oh boy, the church was very strict, very legalistic, condemning all sorts of fun things, and they were also hypocritical and arbitrary, and they were very hurtful to her and some of her friends. And then she went to college. Perhaps she was taught in a private Christian school or homeschooled, so creationism was most of her science curriculum. But when she went to college, she not only met a lot of very cool, warm, friendly and welcoming non-Christians, at the same time she was introduced to the scientific theory of evolution in a serious way. She decided to leave the church, join her new group of friends, and in many ways, evolution sealed the deal. A strong, scientific, logical and undeniable barrier between her current life, where she belongs, and her previous life, where she felt small and alone. Perhaps there is a young man who grew up in a secular household. He went to college, got a job and started a family. But then he went through a difficult time in his life and found a Christian community. They really helped him when he needed them the most, and through them he found God. 
or as he might say, God found him. For most of his life, he believed in evolution because, duh. But now he is in this community and he started to ask some questions. Some of his Christian friends talked him through some things and pointed him to creationist resources. He watched a few videos, read a book or two, and suddenly it all made sense. If anything, those resources strengthened his faith and now he feels as though when someone tries to convince him of evolution, it is an attack on his faith and he fears losing it and his community and then go right back to the worst of the crisis. Just two fictional examples of people who have a deeply personal, instinctual preference for one or the other side of the debate. Both feel threatened when someone is trying to forcefully stuff their arguments down their throats. And it doesn't just change their view on a niche scientific topic. It is about who they are, the community they belong to, the person they became. For some, it may even open up old wounds and bring up trauma. None of this is conductive to watch a fruitful debate or an openness to learn something new and interesting. And then there's the political. Politics has of course always been divisive, but polarization has waxed and waned over the decades. And right now, tempers are high and both sides really dislike each other. Or if you, like me, are from a European country with a multi-party parliamentary system, you may not just dislike the other side, you may dislike all the other sides. If you are anywhere to the left of the center, wherever the center might be in your estimation, you may also have an extra dislike and distrust, if not disgust, towards creationism. The way you see it, they are in the same bucket as people who believe the earth is flat and who believe a small group of Jewish people secretly control the world. You may fear that if creationism gets any more traction, a lot of rights will be stripped away and the next generation will be indoctrinated with fairy tales rather than science, and we will slip right into authoritarianism. If, on the other hand, you are from a more conservative background, you may believe that evolutionism, remember the third definition here, meaning that value and morality are derived from the scientific theory of evolution, will lead to all sorts of bad things. Eugenics, genocide, communist dictatorships, and the like. So both sides both in the personal and in the political realms, may carry heavy, heavy emotional burdens into this debate. These are not games. These are not fun or interesting theoretical debates among specialists. These are civilization determining moral struggles. The lives of millions are at stake and your side must not be allowed to lose. This, again, will not help to make this debate any more than a shouting match and it will close minds and hearts, and it will make it impossible not just to learn anything, but it will also take all the joy out of learning. Learning new facts is no longer about the thrill of exploration. It is about sharpening weapons. I need arguments, and I don't need to learn anything, and just need to convince others. And you know what? I respect that. I do. Because these are big questions, and they do deserve our attention and our dedication. But that's not what I plan to do in this series on this channel. I am merely a guide in this, not even a teacher. In fact, I'm not qualified to teach on most topics related to creation and evolution. All I can do is share the introductory information I have learned myself and then send you on your way. So what may you expect? First of all, this series here is going to be a bit of a hodgepodge of videos. They won't be neatly serialized, as most of my other works on this channel. One video may be about the life of Darwin. The next may be an introduction into cellular biology. Then there is one about classifications of rock types, followed by the philosophy of science according to Karl Popper, followed by a brief exploration of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Secondly, for each video I will mention my sources, something I have so far not done, or at least not consistently done, in my other videos. Third, expect me to stick to the facts more than in other videos. The Bible videos often contain my own opinion, and the Greek philosophy videos are spiced up with some speculation. But given the importance of this topic, I will stick to an adage of facts only as much as I can. Fourth, I will do my very best to accurately portray the various opinions that people have, painting each side in the most charitable light and not misrepresenting someone's opinion. In fact, kind of with the Greek philosophers, if I think someone's argument is poorly stated, I will try to restate the argument in an even better way. Fifth, since some of these topics can get quite in-depth, and since I've opted for longer form videos, 
expect me to occasionally spend quite some time going over basic stuff, providing ample background information as well as necessary building blocks. A video about fossilization may contain a healthy dose of biochemistry and microbiology for example. And finally, you may expect the first several videos to be about less controversial topics, but more about topics that are foundational for other things, or topics more tangentially related to the debate itself. Currently, I have the following videos in various stages of development. An introduction to Gilgamesh, Biological Taxonomy, and Karl Popper's Philosophy of Science. I have a couple of plans for what I'm going to do after this, but it is subject to change. If you have any suggestions or questions, the comment section is open. I will, however, also be monitoring the comments to make sure things remain civilized. I'm not opposed to passionate advocacy, but as this video has hopefully made clear, I want this to be a place of learning and listening more than anything. Solomon out.